I'd like to um, introduce our first speakers after lunch for this session um, discussion around family violence. And I also would like to welcome to the afternoon our facilitator, Jane Gilmore, um, who will be with us for the afternoon and for tomorrow also. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Rob Hulls, who began his career as a solicitor for the Legal Aid Commission of Victoria. And Rob served one term in federal parliament from 1990 to 1993, and on return to Melbourne, was appointed chief of staff for the Victorian leader of the opposition. In his state political career, uh, Rob held the offices of attorney general, minister for manufacturing industry, and minister for racing, minister for work cover, minister for planning, and minister for industrial relations. I note there's no minister for health there, Rob. As Attorney General, Rob instigated significant changes to Victoria's legal system, which saw the establishment of the state's first charter of human rights and reform to Victoria's upper house. He established specialist courts in Victoria, including for Victoria's Indigenous community, for people with mental health issues and for victims of family violence, and introduced an open tender process for applicants to Victoria's judiciary. In October 2012, Rob was appointed adjunct professor at RMIT and was invited to establish the new Centre for Innovative Justice as its inaugural director. The centre's objective is to develop, drive and expand the capacity of the justice system to meet and adapt to the needs of its diverse users. Elena Campbell joins Rob today and she is manager of policy and research at the Centre for Innovative Justice and she's responsible for coordinating the centre's research and policy development as well as its advocacy and communication work. Elena is a policy lawyer and writer with a background in social justice and human rights. And she tells me she is very interested in the oral health issues that we are talking about today. And so I hope that you um, all um, can discuss with her at any time what, what concerns you as well. Um, She's also worked as a consultant to organisations such as the Australian Human Rights Commission. She's the principal author of the Centre's report, uh, Affordable Justice and Opportunities for Early Intervention, bringing perpetrators of family violence into view. And today and now, we're going to hear from Elena and Rob about that report. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Rachel for that, uh, that introduction and uh, what you forgot to mention, I did do one term of, uh, uh, in federal parliament, but uh, whenever, whenever I'm introduced and people mention that, they forget to say that I was beaten by that great scholar Bob Catter. <laughs> so I'm actually the one to blame for Bob Catter being in parliament, I, I do apologise for that. <laughs> but before I start, I do want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I also want to thank the organisers of this very important event for inviting Elena and myself to contribute today. I guess uh, it might be pretty unusual to have a former Attorney General uh, addressing delegates from the health profession, but can I say there are a uh, few areas in which legal and health imperatives more readily combine than in the area of family violence. Certainly the language that policymakers use to describe the challenges associated with family violence has for some time now had a, I guess, a distinctly medical bent to it. The term primary prevention, for example, being widely used, including by the World Health Organization, to stress the importance of averting the attitudes which support and in fact propel family violence. This is the emphasis of the National Foundation Our Watch which promotes the responsibility of all Australians to speak up against family violence. Organisations such as Vic Health, meanwhile, have also been instrumental in leading this very important charge. This audience, of course, would see the manifestation of this analysis in their clinics far too often. Whilst many outside this immediate sphere might think more readily of GPs or hospital emergency departments, as the most obvious site for presentations of family violence, those in this room know that dentists and oral health practitioners also see a wide manifestation of the effects of family violence coming through their doors each and every day. 
from broken bones and teeth through bruises and oral disease to the mental illness, chronic illness, uh, drug and alcohol abuse and complex trauma that so many victims experience, oral health practitioners as primary health practitioners have the task of navigating a complex web of factors to provide the assistance that victims need. Equally, you'll know certain risk factors are directly related to oral health settings. Changes in oral health presenting in pregnancy at the same time as increased risk, and of course increased risk throughout the early parenting years as practitioners try to establish good uh, family <coughs> health. All of these issues will be familiar both to dentists and lawyers who confront the impacts of family violence in their daily practice. The question, however, uh, is to what extent do or should our responses actually intersect? While many of you may consider the legal sphere a world away from the imperatives of your daily work, the legal and medical professions share a distinct set of obligations. Both require hard work, even to contemplate pursuing. Both are overseen by a strict regime of regulation. More importantly, however, both professions have an ethical obligation to their patients or clients, a duty of care that goes beyond most other spheres. It's for this reason, of course, that we enter these professions. The medical and legal spheres offer some of us the privilege and opportunity to make a difference. But with this privilege comes real responsibility. An obligation to do no harm, yes, but also to offer the most well-rounded level of service that we can provide. For example, medical settings are undoubtedly the first opportunity at which many victims of family violence might be able to disclose their experience or actually seek help. Certainly, a growing body of evidence demonstrates the way in which people's medical and legal needs are linked, with a recent Australian-wide survey, for example, revealing that as a first port of call, people often seek advice from primary practitioners about issues that are legal in nature. This can particularly be the case, however, for victims of family violence. Many may be reluctant to report their experiences to police for a wide variety of reasons, or be unaware of what help is actually available. A trip to a health practitioner then is an avenue for non-judgmental assistance, one which will not risk drawing attention from the perpetrator or judgment from the community. This is particularly important for women who are socially or culturally isolated, many from called backgrounds, for example, reluctant to bring shame upon their family by disclosing their experience to any authority. An interaction between a health practitioner and a victim of family violence, therefore, is indeed a very important opportunity that has to be seized much more effectively. One in which the cycle of family violence might be able to be interrupted if the victim is met with the right response. In contrast, we know that men generally attend health services much less frequently than women. Help for tangible physical ailments, such as a, a decaying tooth, uh, may indeed be the most likely thing to bring them to a waiting room. Less tangible challenges, however, like mental illness, substance or alcohol abuse, or problem gambling, are much less likely to be the subject of any kind of help-seeking behaviour. If women are already <coughs> unlikely to, to disclose, and men rarely or never attend, where are the opportunities to intervene with them? And this is where the legal system comes in, and the report that we want to talk to you about today may give you a sense of the kind of opportunities that we can all seize to prevent the cycle of family violence from escalating. I'd like to just uh, play a short video uh, in relation to our report, and indeed how the justice system in the past has failed victims of family violence. Isn't there a saying that says, keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you've always got. We have to make change. 
This report is distinct because for the first time perhaps it focuses on perpetrators of family violence and our legal system's response to them. But it also is distinct because it highlights a range of opportunities that exist now to improve the way the legal system interacts with those perpetrators. For too long perpetrators of family violence have been in the shadows and we need to bring them out of the shadows and put the spotlight firmly on perpetrators. The cost of family violence on our community is astronomical. One in three women, I think the statistics are, are affected by family violence. We're seeing on average two women in Australia um, die each week as a direct result of family violence and the cost on our health system is untold. If we can reduce the rate of family violence in our community even slightly, the, co the benefits to our community are immeasurable. Violence exists in a multiplicity of ways. Intimate partner violence is particularly insidious. It's the ultimate betrayal of trust. And having professionals operate in a system that's fair and accountable in a way that doesn't unwittingly condone or be complicit in violence supporting attitudes is vital. Lawyers have a really important role to play, uh, particularly if they're properly trained about family violence. So if a perpetrator is going to court, clearly it's going to help them understand the process and particularly the outcome of the process if they have a lawyer to work with them through that. If we're talking about an intervention order matter, really an intervention order isn't going to have much effect if the perpetrator doesn't know what it means. Legal advice is critical for applicants and respondents. So both sides to a dispute need assistance because legal advice can help victims uh, keep their families safe, uh, to access appropriate supports and equally legal advice for perpetrators of violence can help them to understand that their behaviour is wrong, it will have negative consequences for them and to access the supports they need to change their behaviour. Men who come in contact with the system aren't then followed up. So we don't have the courts playing a role where um, his actions and his activities are being monitored. Well our report steps out a range of um, initiatives that exist already and ways that um, the justice system can do, interact more effectively, whether it be police having the capacity to refer perpetrators to mental health or alcohol treatment programs, to crisis accommodation, which is a really, really big issue, through to that the importance of that initial contact a perpetrator has at court. Often it's the first time that a perpetrator has been asked about his, not only about his violence, but his experiences or life overall. So that initial contact is really important. It's also really important in terms of the messages that he receives from his lawyer, from support workers, uh, and most importantly, from the magistrate. So we, the report talks about that crucial opportunity that contact with the court provides. Look, I think there needs to be a range of interventions, uh, whether it be uh, by police, by the courts, or by corrections. Those interventions have to take place early and often to make it quite clear to perpetrators of family violence that their behaviour is totally unacceptable. What the report's saying is that at every point at which men connect with the system, we're utilising that as a means of connecting him into programs. We're using that to gather information um, uh, that's relevant to risk and risk management. Um, and the system is uh, looking at ways in which he might be able to um, uh, feel the consequences of his choices as opposed to uh, women having to feel those consequences. If that magistrate knows what he's said in, on past occasions and can remind him of that, uh, he's then accountable. And if he's coming back repeatedly and having a building up some sort of rapport with that magistrate, that can have a very therapeutic effect. Corrections has a really key role to play in perpetrator accountability. So corrections have a role to make sure that everyone they come into contact with is assessed uh, for risk of family violence or a history of family violence. That everyone who's suitable is provided with family violence programs, programs and treatment to prevent family violence in the future. And also corrections has a role in working with other 
people and services who are working in the area, for working with women's support services and other family violence agencies to try and make sure they're part of an integrated response that actually supports victims and holds perpetrators to account. Look, we have um, a group of men in our community who, because of their behaviour, um, cost us. So, cost us in relation to the rates of, of homelessness. So, um, uh, family violence is cited as a factor of 44% of Victoria's homelessness. It costs us in relation to um, uh, harm to children. It's a factor in over 50% of substantiated child protection cases, a factor in 80% of child deaths known to DHS. Um, and it costs the Victorian economy uh, 3.4 billion every year. That's not so far, that's every year. We don't call for an entire rewrite of the system. It's not theoretical, it won't sit on a shelf. We're going around talking to governments right around Australia, talking to police, talking to corrections about ways they can act right now to make those interactions with perpetrators more, effect more effective. These are opportunities that exist. It's about having the time and resources to do them properly, about having sufficient legal services, support workers, and court infrastructure and magistrates time to spend uh, with perpetrators to really um, get the most out of the system that currently exists. It is a gender issue and it is about power and control. And I'm living testament to the worst of those cases when my little boy Luke was killed as a final act of power and control. Now Greg was able to dominate and control the court process because in the current format and the way it operates that happens all of the time. Unfortunately our justice system for too long has put the burden on victims of family violence that has to change and the burden needs to be removed from victims and put squarely on the system itself. Okay, so that's the report, and I'd like to call up now the author of the report, uh, Elena Campbell, to explain how the report actually fits in uh, and is relevant to people uh, who are working in the oral health area. Uh, firstly, Elena, there's been a lot of reports on family violence. Um, what is different about this one? Well, as our video said, um, our report is quite distinct in that it uh, focuses on the perpetration or the source of the violence, people who use violence in a way that our, our legal system certainly hasn't had the opportunity to do so far. Uh, it's taken a long time for family violence to be recognised as the issue that it really is and our legal system as a consequence has actually been galloping to keep up. We know that crisis services for women and children are drastically underfunded, we know that our courts are overwhelmed so really there hasn't been the opportunity or the time to look at, well, how could we get to, how, how can we intervene or interact more effectively with where the violence is coming from, where the abuse is coming from. Currently, as, as Rosie's indicated and her, as her story so um, palpably illustrates, um, perpetrators of violence are often bounced away from the legal system, sent, propelled away from scrutiny rather than being drawn in. So the themes that we wanted to draw out from this report is ways in which at each point of interaction with any man manifestation of the legal system, that interaction could become more effective and uh, more meaningful so that p potentially the uh, cycle of violence can, or the escalation of violence can be interrupted. The links, however, with any health sphere, including oral health, is that uh, the responsibility should not and cannot fall on just one part of um, a system or one system itself. And as you've seen, um, we had to do some work to map out even within the legal system where those opportunities might lie. Can't just, um, the responsibility can't just lie with police. Police need help, the police need to understand and be equipped with um, opportunities and information about referrals that they can make. The court needs to leverage their, the opportunity that their interaction poses. Corrections need to um, leverage that opportunity. But so too an opportunity lies within broader environments within the health sphere and within the education sphere and beyond, obviously, um, 
to draw those threads through and uh, make all of those interactions and make the most of those interactions that we have with people experiencing family violence. And from the research you undertook, um, are you able to say whether or not this is already happening in some health settings? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, the concurrence of legal and health settings are, are where some of the most valuable work is occurring. There's a great service going into uh, the Royal Women's Hospital that many of you might be aware of where women attending for pre or postnatal appointments uh, who may not be in a position to seek uh, health advice or help in any other um, circumstance um, can get referrals to lawyers in that environment and so seek ad legal advice within the protected environment where it's not drawing attention from the perpetrator and there are other examples like that. Uh, but we need to leverage those and draw out those themes more broadly and uh, apply it across the board. And what about training? What sort of training is required to ensure that um, the community health sector and uh, indeed the, the legal sector work more effectively together? Yeah, oh, training is essential. Training is essential even for lawyers. What's funny is that, um, well, it's not funny, it's tragic, but family violence is, the, is core business in our legal system. It's certainly core business in our courts and for many people here you'd know it's pretty much core business in health and community settings as well. Uh, but even lawyers uh, are not necessarily trained to know how to respond. They might have individual clients coming to them on a range of matters that are to do with employment law, certainly family law is a, is a big one. It could be a range of matters but family violence will come up as a backdrop and they've not been trained or equipped to know how to respond. Uh, so anybody interacting with individual people really needs that training, any professionals to know how to respond. Uh, so one of the th themes that we feature in the report is the fact that even Victoria Legal Aid duty lawyers who are employed to uh, give representation to respondents in intervention order matters um, have recently been given specialist family violence training. And it's been a bit of a... Um, an issue with which lawyers have had to grapple with because the responsibility of lawyers as they see, as they said, is well I'm here to represent my client and the interest of my client, that fellow over there, is to actually to get him off as much as I, you know, to minimise the behaviour, to deny it, to hopefully not cheat home any consequences. But the broader obligation that a lawyer has not only to the client but to the court is to prevent that client from being propelled into further violent behaviour. Um, so Victoria Legal Aid has been working with their lawyers to help them understand ways in which they can interact <coughs> with their client, sow a seed that makes him think about what he might be doing in the future. And that's, a, again, a lesson we need to apply across broader spheres. OK, last question. Um, the Royal Commission uh, will make recommendations to the government uh, in February of next year. And as an ex-politician, uh, uh, the question of costs will arise and there'll be an argument as to whether or not uh, it is cost effective or where's the money going to come from to implement many of the recommendations. Um, the recommendations in your report will have costs associated with them. Uh, what about the costs um, and how they can be met and uh, is it an issue? Absolutely, the recommendations in our report alone, let alone the, um, what the Royal Commission are going to make, are going to have significant cost implications. And nobody should shy away or from or apologise for that. Because one thing we do know is that family violence already costs us astronomically as a community. What's more, we know that that investment or those costs are not making any difference. It's not making it better. So what we need to do is look at investing in ways to intervene earlier, prevent the escalation of violence, prevent violence supportive attitudes from developing in the first place, assist people across a range of sectors to know how to respond when family violence pre presents. When we do that, we take the burden off the, um, the, the downstream end of the system. We take the burden off the demand that is being currently being placed, the incredible demand that is not being met on crisis services. So if we can invest earlier, we might actually start to reduce the costs of family violence. And just on that, you had a look at an early intervention program in the UK? We did, Rob. <laughs> mm. what did Good like? prompt. <laughs> one of the programs that we looked at in the, uh, was one run in the UK. It's a behaviour change program that works with men in uh, what might be termed the early stages of violence when they're self-referring. And um, 
a very detailed return on investment study uh, confirmed or found that um, by saving just one fi family violence related homicide, that prevention program could be run um, fully operated for four years. So to us it's a bit of a no-brainer. If you get in early, you can actually save some money and save lives at the same time. Okay, so, so that's our report. Um, we're through from here. It's been fed into the Royal Commission. It's a major submission to the Royal Commission on Family Violence. Um, and we hope that the Royal Commission will take up its recommendations. Uh, Elena and I have also been travelling around meeting with attorneys, meeting with Chief Commissioners of Police, uh, a whole range of stakeholders right around the country uh, in relation to, to, uh, to the report. Uh, and we hope that governments um, of all situations in all jurisdictions will take up the recommendations in relation to the report. It's not, um, it's not um, an area that's uh, so easy to deal with uh, in the family violence sphere, you know, giving support services to perpetrators. Uh, but the reality is, as Rosie herself said, uh, she did all the right things, you know. She, she went to court, took out an intervention order. The fact is that many stages along the, uh, the line, Greg was homeless. He was actually living out of his car and he couldn't be found to have those intervention orders served upon him. So it is important that we intervene early, we intervene often, but we also need to put support services around perpetrators of family violence as well, to bring them out of the shadows into the spotlight, and everyone here has a role to play. Uh, and I think, to be frank with you, and I conclude on this note, that the modern 21st century legal practices won't just consist of lawyers, they'll be multidisciplinary practices, where you have oral health workers working alongside GPs, working alongside lawyers, social workers, psychologists and psychiatrists, to ensure that the holistic needs of people are met. I have no doubt about that. And we're about to start one up at RMIT, uh, where we have uh, the Mental Health Legal Centre re-established on-site at RMIT. Lawyers go into the female prison to assist female prisoners of all their other legal issues before they come out. So they might go into jail for a drug offence while they're there. There's family law issues, tenancy issues, debts that build up. This service goes into the prison to assist them with those issues. We're about to turn that into a multidisciplinary practice where social workers and social work students as well will give wraparound services to these female prisoners before they come out and for at least six months after they're released. And in my view, that is a modern 21st century holistic legal practice and we all have a role to play.